Welcome back to The Cinnamon Effect. I'm Kimberly Hand, and today I have with me Dr. Kunal Gandhi, who is a functional medicine practitioner. She has extensive training in primary care and functional medicine, which has fueled a deep passion for an integrative, holistic, and preventative approach. By merging traditional and holistic medicine, she guides her patients to take control of their health, reverse chronic conditions, and activate self-healing at a cellular level. Her approach examines you as a whole, considering genetics, lifestyle, environmental, and mental well-being, avoiding the isolation of symptoms. She is amazing, and I'm Thank so you. I'm so happy to have you here with me Thank today. You for me. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. And I started seeing Dr. Gandhi over two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I just have to say that when I saw her, she changed my life. And you've been a big part of my journey. And so that's why it was so important for me to have you here to share your knowledge with, with everyone, all my listeners. Well, thank you for having me. You were a big part of your own journey because you put in the hard work. (laughs) It is not easy. So uh, good job to you for like putting in the work, taking the time and making yourself a priority. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my very first appointment with you, I, I think I probably cried through most of it. I might've cried with you. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's funny that you say that because I did feel like I was, you were like really seeing me and seeing the, what I was going through. Like I was at such a point where I felt like I had not gotten any answers. I had seen other doctors and, you know, they had run tests, but obviously nothing as comprehensive as what you do. But I was kind of just oh, well, your hormones might be a little off, you know, or they tested me and they said, oh, but your hormones look okay. And, you know, it was just, I wasn't getting like any, any answers I didn't feel like. And then I saw you and you really, I felt like were getting me. And you, one of the first things you said to me was, you know, you had looked at my history and I had Um, And I've talked about a lot of this on the show, but, you know, talking about PTSD and things like that. And you really addressed me, not just talking about lab work or anything like that. It was the whole, the whole person, everything that I was going through from emotional trauma to the physical symptoms, you really took all of that into consideration. And I knew when I met you, like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I needed. Like this, my prayers were answered. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you. And again, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, So I kind of want to start for people that maybe have never even heard about functional medicine and don't really know what it is. Absolutely. So, and you are trained in both. You're trained in conventional medicine as well as functional medicine. So can you kind of break down for us, like what are the things that a functional medicine doctor does versus just a conventional doctor? It's a great question. So I, you know, conventional medicine is really treating a patient based on research and science. Well, functional medicine does the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think with conventional medicine, it's always like, what does the patient have? And here is the treatment. Whereas in functional medicine, really diving deep into like, why does the patient have this? Like, why do you have heart disease? Why do you have diabetes? And let's deal with that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I like to combine the both. You know, if I have to put somebody on some kind of conventional medicine to help them get off of it and using supplements and IVs and different kind of, you know, I just have a bigger toolkit, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, A great example is a patient going in and, you know, telling their primary care physician that I'm tired, you know, and poor Susie over here is 55 years old. She's tired and the doctor throws on a vitamin D and iron and she comes back and they're like, okay, your D is a little bit low. And, you know, three months later, she's still feeling tired. Well, then she goes to a functional medicine doctor and they're really diving deep. They're saying, okay, well, you're 55 years old. You haven't had a cycle in five years. You live on a golf course. You had a, you know, roof leak three years ago. And that's really where the focus is. Let's go like check your hormones. Let's check, uh, like, let's check your mold toxicities. Let's check, you know, do you have heavy metals? Susie loves to eat fish all the time. So Mm -hmm. that's really the difference is that we're looking for why and digging a little bit deeper. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to get into all this stuff like mold and heavy metals and all these things, right? Pesticides. Like you mentioned living on a golf course. Is that like a pesticide factor that you'd be worried about? Okay. Okay. Yeah. All the fumes and pesticides that you get from living close to a golf course is, I, I see it all the time or even like my pilot's 
you know, full, like they're flying all the time, all that gasoline that they're getting exposed to. Um, a lot of the farmers. Yeah. It's so interesting. Cause I think, yeah, a lot of people don't consider that. What are you doing? What are these things that are you're, you're doing that are contributing to, you know, some of the problems you're having, right? So like where <clears throat> patients live mm-hmm. plays a big role. The type of water that they drink plays a big role in their health. Um, you know, their, their house, if there's water leaks, water damage, are you getting your house sprayed with pesticides, you know, every few mm-hmm. months, that's a big thing. Are you not getting your vents cleaned like you should, you know, once or twice a year. So that plays a big role. And, um, you know, the patients and, and the way that we treat them would be first finding out what it is, what is their big trigger. Then it's always going to be opening up their pathways, getting their body ready for detox. You know, a lot of people will read online like, oh, glutathione is great for like detoxing, but you really should be working on your detox pathways and then going into a detox to pull all these like toxins out of your body. Okay. So I want to start. Okay. So detox pathways, is that a good starting point? Like let's, let's chat about that a little bit. Like how does someone work on their detox pathways? Yeah. So pretty much across the board, whenever I first meet with a patient and I don't know if you recall, but it's a really long health history Yes, and it really dives into like what kind of water you're drinking, you know, how, or like, do you have shower filters? Do you have air purifiers? Like, you know, what is your, what, it, what is your lifestyle? Like what, are, what foods are you eating? So that first day we're really diving deep into how to clean out your environment. So I sometimes mm-hmm. joke and call myself an environmental doctor because I'm just cleaning out patients' environments, but they're putting on their body, in their body and around their body. So So that's usually day one and just kind of letting the patient know like it's a stepwise process and you're going to slowly get rid of like your regular cleaners that you have in the house and let's get something a little bit healthier and safer for your body and your family. Um, And then their next appointment is when their labs come back. And now their body's kind of ready. So, okay. So the first, the first appointment I remember as well, like we did, we, we addressed like, you, did you, you were like, do you think that you've been exposed to mold in any way? Um, yeah. Have you had your, your vents cleaned all the stuff? So I went like this laundry list of things, which I love because this is kind of part, you know, like feng shui as well, like keeping the environment as supportive and healthy as possible. Right. Yeah. So I did all those things. I also cut out a a lot of foods like right off the bat. (laughs) So can you talk a little bit about like what you recommend just right out of the gate? If, if anyone is looking to make changes, you're saying make these changes in your environment and also make these changes with your diet. Yeah. So So. that is usually a really big conversation during the first appointment is what are you putting in your body? And I love to use the word lifestyle, Mm -hmm. you know, diet to me sounds very short term and it's like, okay, I feel better. Now I'm going to go back to doing the things that I was doing that didn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. So it's more about a lifestyle and taking it one week at a time, you know, and once it becomes this like thing that you've been doing for a while, it just, it comes automatic. Um, I typically focus on cutting out the anti-inflammatory foods, like the foods that are, sorry, sticking to like, an anti-inflammatory diet. So Mm -hmm. the foods that cause a lot of inflammation, that's going to be like your gluten and your corn and sugar um, and dairy. Those cause a lot of inflammation in the body. So starting with cutting out those foods and just even if like some patients really have a struggle with this and I just say like pick, pick two of those, pick Mm -hmm. two of those that you can cut out and, and, you know, at the end of the week journal, make note, make a mental note of, do you feel a little bit better? Mm -hmm. And if you do try it out for another week, And maybe that next week, try to get sugar out of your diet too. And just slowly start removing these foods out of your diet. And these are for patients who are coming to me feeling pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to tell somebody who feels great, looks great, works out, does all the right things to be like, you can never have, you know, you shouldn't have sugar. It's not really the goal to cut it out forever, Mm -hmm. right? The goal is to get to a good place that you feel good. You're looking good. You're working out. You're sleeping well. Your moods are great. And then if like, you know, it's your birthday, you're traveling and you eat those foods, like it's okay. You know, the right things to do and you have the ability to like get back to like what works for your body and keeping yourself healthy. And that to me is sustainable. It's something that you could do forever, you know? And so cutting out those inflammatory foods, number one, Mm -hmm. and then number two is going to be just some basic vitamins. I, I think that, you know, across the board, I've checked, gosh, thousands and thousands of labs now on patients. Yeah. And it, and I came up with these basic five. If any of my patients are listening, they're probably laughing because they know the exactly, basic five. Yes. They know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about because every single appointment we, we, 
put it in their heads and make sure that they remember you got to take your multivitamin, you got to take your D, your B, your fish oil, your probiotic. I think those are so essential um, just, just for energy, metabolism, day-to-day life, detoxing, your immune system. So important. Yeah. The basic five. I, I think, so I ended up, okay. So to, to kind of correlate my story with what you're saying, I was like, I'm going full gorilla on cutting out everything all at once. I, I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of it any other way. Like, why am I justifying this inflammatory food when I know it's not great for me? So I just was like, everything's got to go, <laughs> <laughs> including alcohol, yeah. which I think is really you know, is a tough one for a lot of people. And when I have, I've referred some patients and they're like, but I just can't, I just can't get rid of the cheese or I just can't get rid of the alcohol or whatever it is. Um, It also can be like a very overwhelming like thought, you know, to, to be doing this. Do you find, do you find that people, some people just get too overwhelmed with like what you're telling them to do? Like, how do you, I feel like it's as much of a mental shift as it is what you're actually eating and doing. How do you like kind of coach them through that? Cause I absolutely, yeah. I, think every, <laughs> I think every patient by the end of the appointment are, they're like, that was a lot. I'm like, I know, I know, yeah. I know it was a lot. Like I do to you guys. I like, I do to myself what I do to you guys. Yeah, like, I yeah. hope every patient knows that. Like I do all these things. I, I, you know, everything. Um, one week at a time. Yeah. That, okay. that is how I conquer it. Like, you know, if whatever day of the week they're seeing me, I just say, okay, in like one to two days, you know, do your grocery shopping. And mm-hmm. this week, this is how I'm going to eat. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that week, you reflect back and you say like, do I feel a little bit better? You know, mm-hmm. 95% of the time patients feel better. Yes. They, they, they're, it's impossible not to feel better yeah. if you just eat a little bit cleaner and you make yourself pr- a priority. Mm-hmm. You know, you, some patients you're going to go through a little bit of a detox when you cut out sugar and you cut out gluten because you stop feeding infections mm-hmm. at that point, right? Like candida and yeast live off of sugar. And when you stop feeding them, they're going to die off. So just imagine these little like candida bubbles in your body. And now we stop feeding them. They're going to burst open Yeah, and you're going to feel kind of crummy. And I, walk my patients through that. Like you're going to detox, you're going to withdraw from the sugar and the gluten that you've been eating. Mm -hmm. And if you can fight through it for that second week, third week is kind of where it really hits my patients. Um, that towards the end of the third into the fourth week, something like, uh, like a blueberry will just feel so sweet to you. You won't need that cookie Mm -hmm. and cake and the candy that you were eating before, but it's just one week at a time and always forgiving yourself that if you don't make it, if you you don't, if you don't get through that week, that is okay. Like that is okay. Don't beat yourself up. Don't say, forget it all. You know, talk about it again when I see Dr. Gandhi in another month. Like, no, that, that don't, don't be upset. We're all human. We all make mistakes. It is okay. You know, you slipped up, you went out, you know, you had the drink and the next day you're going to get back on it. Yeah, that's right. Have like grace with yourself. I did uh, one appointment in particular. I had been really dedicated and devoted to being perfect. And that is something that I struggle with. I have this perfectionism thing that I'm trying to overcome. (laughs) And I remember coming in there and I was so emotional and I was like, I have not been taking my supplements like I should. And I've fallen off the wagon with my diet. And I was really down on myself. And I remember you were like, it's okay. Like you're so much of a cheerleader. You're like, you're good. It's fine. Like you're going to get right back to it. And I did. And I, uh, you know, and so Whereas like you're saying, I was super strict and then I kind of fell off the wagon and then I got back on and now I feel like I'm found like a more consistent, you know, just regimen to follow. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the like blood work that you do? Because this is way more comprehensive than I think most people have ever seen. (laughs) Yeah. So it'd probably go back to my health history that Mm -hmm. I pick up on my patients. So my patients don't love filling out my health history, but I think when they get to their first appointment, they're like, oh, okay, it makes sense now. Like Mm -hmm. I, you know, that health history can take some patients over an hour to do. Mm -hmm. And it's very detailed and I read every single line of it. Mm -hmm. And that helps me pick out what blood work I'm going to get on my patients. So 
if, you know, they are talking about water leaks, water damage, I might consider a mold test on them Mm -hmm. depending on where they live or if they're really big into eating fish and they're, you know, that's a huge part of their diet. I'm going to go diving into their heavy metals, Mm -hmm. you know, pretty much everybody across the board, especially adults are getting a hormone panel. They're getting autoimmune panel. We're going to be getting like cardiac markers on them. Um, my adult patients typically were looking at like 40 to 45 vials of blood mm-hmm. through their health insurance. Um, and then the specialized tests kind of come along with that depending on each patient. So again, depending on symptoms, gut symptoms, you know, chronic fatigue, cancer patients, I'm really going to tailor their blood work or their specialized testing based on that. Stool testing is another big one that I do mm. on a lot of my patients. Um, and what is the stool testing showing? Yeah. So that test is really fun. So <laughs> poop test. <laughs> yes. yes. I, oh, I love the patients that are like, so like proper. And I'm like, now we're going to get a stool test. And they're just like, oh, uh, I've never done one. <laughs> So I think I would be that way too. Yeah. So it checks a lot of like your bacterial overgrowth. It checks for H. pylori, which is another bacteria that can cause a lot of heartburn in your body. It checks for viruses, it checks for parasites. It checks for candida yeast. Um, it checks to see if you have leaky gut. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have like an over inflammation in your gut, it checks if your body is like not producing enough digestive enzymes to break down the foods that you're eating. It gives me so much information about my patients did even show me some bacteria that are usually like more common in the sinuses. And you think about post-nasal drip and some people swallow that and ends up in the gut. Ah, uh, interesting. So, so it, it's, it's a really good test for those patients who are really struggling. I mean, I think it's great if everybody could do it once a year, mm-hmm. once every other year, but those patients who are really struggling with like gut stuff. It's really, really helpful because some of those patients, you know, I'm like, okay, we're actually going to attack your sinuses for this one. And they're like, what? And so like, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, oh my gosh. So, So I know with me, like I went in thinking I'm a relatively healthy person and I cut out all this stuff and I thought my blood work was going to be glowing. Like, (laughs) like I'm sure you probably see people that are like, oh my God, I had no idea that all of this was going on, you know? Um, so from there, like, because I, I had started cutting out all those foods and then you had said that it takes what, like three months to show up on your blood work. Like when you start making all of those changes, right? So like, it's a little delayed. So you think like, oh, I've been cutting out all this stuff, but it's like, no, it's showing all this like previous history of, of things that you have. Yeah. Um, so the detox pathways, so you've gotten someone's labs back and, how, how do you help them like open up those pathways? How, how can people kind of work on that? I think in general, they need to be open. Like you need to be able to detox freely. Right. So yeah. How do you Um, work on that? So glutathione is a big one or N-acetylcysteine NAC is another big one that I use. Um, we like to do a lot of lymph massages. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really good. I love saunas to help with that. Um, clean eating is really, really big too. Milk thistle is a great supplement to help Mm. with your, uh, like liver and your detox pathways. Um, some patients I will put them on a one to two week, like fast almost like, like really detox them hard. Um, I like to use Prolon as one. Okay. Um, that one's like a five day fast. And then Core Restore has a seven to 14 day fast where you're taking certain supplements and eating certain foods and just really opening up and cleaning out. Again, it's, it's really based on the patient and what they're dealing with, but those are some of the like major modalities that I use to help like open up those detox pathways with my patients. Mm, Okay. And you use some IV therapy as well. So how does that work? Like I, I, that is something it's funny because I don't like needles, like not at all. I can't, I can't look at the needle. Mm -hmm. I I just, it's, that was like a big block for me thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to do these IVs and I I don't even know like how I'm going to do it, but I I knew I needed to, I I knew that I needed to like make this change and like support my body. So how do you, how do you utilize that for people? Yeah. So I love IVs. I think they're great because so many people have so much gut inflammation. So sometimes it's even hard to say like what they're absorbing when we're giving them supplements. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my patients, to be honest, they aren't very good at taking supplements. Mm. You know, a lot lot of them are good. I shouldn't say that, but some of them really struggle with that. So it's nice to be like, you know what, once a week you come in for these IVs Mm -hmm. and we're putting it straight into your body. And so many patients like you, they really do struggle with like the IVs and getting stuck, but hopefully like you, um, a 
lot of them start to get used to it. They mm-hmm. realize the benefits of it. And you always relate like getting stuck or needles with like hospitals and bad situations and maybe a little bit of trauma back there. But now you're like sitting in this like great atmosphere and great people and, you know, like-minded folks around you all hanging yes. out. And it's a really pleasant experience. And then when you get out of there, you just feel good. Like you feel like more energized, you feel more hydrated, your skin's looking better, you're feeling better, you're more productive. Um, I love IVs. Probably my favorite IV is going to be ozone. It's like super oxygen. Yeah. And so that's where you take out some of your blood. We inject it with ozone. It kind of cleans out your blood and we put it back in your body. And it's really safe and it works really well. And it's really good for um, infections, inflammation, um, uh, cancer patients. It has so many benefits. And after you do some ozone, you can always tag it on with some vitamin C and your B and your D and um, kind of getting some really good nutrition in. Yeah. Like supercharge. Yeah. And it does. It feels really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. like, cause I did a series, I think of 10, mm-hmm. like almost two years ago. Yeah. And I remember feeling like at first you, you do kind of maybe feel a little off. And then as it starts to kind of the repetition of doing it week after week, it like feels really amazing. Yeah. Cause some people can actually detox from the IVs, right? Cause we were killing off infections. So yes. that's where you start feeling some of those detox symptoms. Um, but they, I mean, the end result, I find it amazing. It really is helpful for patients. Yeah. No, that's uh, so amazing. Um, so what do you think about like, recommendations on alcohol, because that is a a hot topic with people. And people are like, oh, Kimberly, I couldn't go there because I, you know, I'm not going to stop drinking. And it's like, well, I don't think you have to stop drinking forever. Right. Right. So you tell us a little bit about that. I love that question too, because I do find that a lot of my patients, again, it depends on like, what are you coming in for? Like, Mm -hmm. how bad are you feeling? If you're coming to me and you're like run down, can't function, can't go to work, like, you know, going, you know, your body's going through hormonal changes, whatever the case may be. Absolutely. I'm probably going to tell you to stop alcohol Mm -hmm. and it's not forever. Just like you said, it it might be for a month, two months, three months. It really depends. Everybody's body is different. Your body might detox in three months and cleanse and feel good. And I might take six months. Yeah, You know, everybody's a little bit different and we kind of touch base with those patients and see like, okay, you know, at this three month mark, you're doing really good. And if you are going to drink, we, I call it keeping it clean and clear, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, drink like, like vodka, soda, lime or tequila, soda, lime. If you're struggling with moods, I usually go with more of like a tequila. It's one of the only ones that are not depressing to your body mm, and mm-hmm. to your moods. Um, but I would love for my patients to stop that alcohol. That would be my number one recommendation is to cut it out. I mean, I'm guilty too. And every once in a while I'll drink as well. And I don't feel good. I really don't feel good. Like every night when, and and not every night, whenever I do drink that night, my, my heart rate will be higher. I'll wake up feeling like anxious, but I'm like, I'm fine. Like, I don't like, yeah. I'm, like, <laughs> I know, like, I know, this coming from? I know anxiety. I, I've had it plenty of times. It was like, I'm like, I don't, feel like I'm going through stuff that needs to be making me feel anxious, but I feel anxious. I don't feel good. The next day I'm not as productive. I'm not as fast or sharp. Mm -hmm. It's not good. It's really not good. And it's a toxin that you're putting in your body. Your body's going to fight off that toxin before it fights off anything else. Mm. So if you are struggling with weight or any kind of autoimmune disorder and, and you're drinking alcohol, like you're, you're just like, it's, you're not doing yourself any. Yeah. You're not doing yourself a service, right? Yeah. It's not helping. And like those patients who are coming to me and taking all these supplements and getting the IVs and doing like taking such good care of yourself. And then you're drinking, you know, one or two glasses of wine every night. Well, you're just like keeping the bucket right where it's at. You're not really getting the stuff out of the bucket. You're just keeping it right there. That makes total sense. And that, that was really my realization too, because my goal was really to just to cut out alcohol for three months. And then it just was like, well, I don't know. What's the point? Yeah, <laughs> like, you feel so point? good. Why yeah. go back to doing what you're doing? Uh, again, you know, I'm always going to support my patients in whatever decision they make, and I'm going to help them get through whatever decision that they make. If they decide that, you know, for work or life or travel, whatever, they want to drink alcohol and continue, I'm going to support them and I'm going to teach them how to detox better from the alcohol, but I'm always going to re- recommend that they cut it out the best they can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What about the like gut brain barrier? I feel like, like we're hearing a lot of this right now, this gut brain barrier. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, there is something called the, like the, the 
axis between the gut and the brain. And there, that's how the brain and the gut communicate with each other. And, um, you know, one silly example, and I wouldn't say this is the only reason, but like when somebody bonks their head really hard and they vomit, that's part of that, like gut and the brain are like not happy. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a huge correlation between the two. So those patients who are really struggling with like anxiety, depression, um, I would love to look at them and say, all right, we're, you know, I know you're really depressed and I know you can't get out of bed today. And I, I know taking these five, six supplements is going to be tough for you and working out and all these things. Um, I try to do the, that with those patients. I mm -hmm. try to talk about like, I, I teach them that how your gut is so important for your, your mental health. And 85% of your serotonin receptors are in your gut. Mm. So if your gut is not happy and healthy, your brain is not happy and healthy. I cannot think to this day of one patient that I have, and I'm actually like actively thinking right now that yeah. has anxiety, depression, or any kind of mood stuff that tells me that they have two great bowel movements every single day and they have no gut issues. Mm. Cannot think of one patient. Um, it, it, it goes hand in hand. So as you clean your gut and as you protect your gut and, and nourish your gut, your brain is going to work better. You're going to think faster. You're going to sleep better. Your anxiety, depression is going to get better. And now these serotonin receptors in your gut can actually work, you know, so traditional medicine, they're going to put you on like Zoloft and Prozac. And what they do is they link onto those receptors and they stop your body from breaking down serotonin. Mm. Well now, and they always tell you, it's going to take two to three weeks to start working. Well, you can actually clean out your gut. You can take some more natural supplements like GABA, L-theanine to help your body make serotonin and you can actually feel better mentally and your gut can feel better too. Wow. Yeah, it's so powerful. And, you know, I think people are starting to talk about it now, but yeah, like who would have thought that, you know, this is all, you know, in, in your in your gut yeah. area. It's, yeah. wi it's wild to me. Another thing that I think was really, uh, instrumental in the foods I chose to eat, to eat was doing the food sensitivity and allergy test, because I will tell you when my test came back, it was foods that are considered relatively healthy that I was reactive to. Yeah. And I think a lot of people think, well, oh, I'm eating this and it's super healthy. Oh, I'm eating broccoli and it's very healthy. So, but your body could be reacting poorly to that food, right? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about food sensitivities? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, you're, you're so right. So some people could be eating really healthy, but they have leaky gut. So all that broccoli and chicken that they're eating mm -hmm. could be leaking out into their blood serum and causing an immune reaction. So your mm. body is like, why is broccoli and chicken out here and causing an army to attack those foods? So now every time you eat that healthy food, your body feels inflamed. You feel tired and sluggish. Uh, that's another test I love for a lot of my patients to do because you can actually do something with the results. You can actually sit there, fix it, work on it and move on. So, um, you know, there's something called anaphylaxis. So if you mm -hmm. eat some type of food and that's more of a medical emergency and you end up in the ER, you take an EpiPen, your lips blow up, your throat's closing, that's, that's bad. Mm -hmm. And then you get allergies. Allergies mean you eat something and pretty shortly after you start like clearing your throat or you might feel a little itchy or watery eyes or bloated or just fatigued out and sensitive. Sensitivities. sensitivities hit you a couple days later mm -hmm. and it can last months in your body. So those patients are like, well, you know, I just eat that pizza, you know, once a month. Well, once a month, your body is causing months of inflammation. Wow. So you can't really get ahead of it. Yeah. You know, so I love that test because it can really dive down into what each patient should and shouldn't eat. Because I usually, during the first appointment, I cut out eggs in all my patients. I tell them, don't eat eggs. They're really inflammatory. Until we get this test back, I prefer you don't eat eggs. And then, can, can you talk a little bit about the egg thing? Yeah. Because I think <laughs> that is like shocking because yeah. we've all been taught that eggs are like a very healthy food. And I cut out eggs over two years ago. But tell why you you tell patients that right off the bat, like to avoid eggs. Well, it's really inflammatory. Okay. And... You, I mean, again, eight, I would say, gosh, 95% of my patients, when I check them, eggs are through the roof, like mm. your body. And it's showing up as an allergy and a sensitivity, not just like, okay, you know, you might get a little sniffly nose or something like that. No, like there's significant reactions in my patients. So those patients who are like, like, 
you know, eating their three, four eggs in the morning, you know, for yes. they're trying to lose weight and they really can't, or they have like hormonal disturbances and they're just like, I don't know what to do. I'm eating eggs. I'm, you know, having all these healthy foods throughout the day. Um, it, it's just so inflammatory. So I cut it out until we're proven otherwise. If we get your test back and you do, okay, <clears throat> again, just a handful of patients across the board. I'll tell them, you know, you can reintroduce eggs and kind of be mindful about it. It's a great source of protein. So it does kind of like hurt when I have to tell patients yes. not to take it, but it, it's just so inflammatory and we have other ways we can get good protein in. So why, why is it so inflammatory though? Cause I it's feel like that's- way that they're, they're like- raised, you know, mm. like they're just all, all the, the, you know, the animals have put in little area and they're just like eating the bad grains and it's just the way that they're made. Yeah. It, which it's funny. Cause when you told me not to eat eggs and then my test came back and I was highly reactive to eggs. So it made total sense, but I had always had like an aversion to eggs. I never really liked them. I kind of would eat them because I felt like, yes, it's a good source of protein. Like I should be eating this. Um, but I never really liked the texture. To be honest, they kind of grossed me out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, intuitively, maybe I was, my body was telling me that I should avoid that. But I was still, you know, still eating those <laughs> eggs, you know. <laughs> but now it's been over two years and I feel like I've moved past the eggs. Now they they do get like they're snuck into certain foods or, yeah. you know, baked items, which right. I feel like I kind of avoid anyway because the gluten thing. Right. So avoid gluten as well. Another but big one that shows up in all patients is all that patients. gluten. Yeah. It's again, it's the way it's grown. It's the way it's made. It's glue. It's just there's nothing really beneficial to gluten. Like let's get rid of it. But yeah. I know it's tough. You know, I don't want to say like it was easy. It took, it took me years to get there too. Yeah. Yeah. It's still every so often I like, I'm like, I know I'm going to pay for this, but I'm going to eat it. But that's the thing <laughs> that you figured it out. Like you're, you know, you're not eating gluten for a week straight and then going to your doctor be like, Oh, you know, I'm bloated. And I don't know why, like, you know why, yes. you know why, like you've learned that gluten and you just don't get along and you're going to, you know, have it every once in a while, you're going to kind of pay for it and you're going to move on. You're not yep. going to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I try not to, I, you know, I notice, um, bloating, of course, like an itchiness to my skin. Is that yeah. something that's kind of common? Well, gluten turns into sugar in your body and mm. sugar feeds yeast candy to fungus. Mm. So yeah, you're going to get a little bit of that too, but everybody's reactions are a little bit different. Um, I, I know for sure every time I eat gluten, like I'll, it, it's, I get, I get the bloated, but it's like, <clears throat> like constantly clearing my throat. Yes. And, and it, it's like, it doesn't stop your day. It's not the worst thing, but when you're like talking all day for work and you're like, <clears throat> like it's like, no, this isn't worth it anymore. Like, why does it do that? It's so weird because you wouldn't think a food would be causing like a, a little, like, yeah. Congestion in your throat, right? Yeah. It's a mucus production, inflammation. Now, you know, a lot of the patients that like travel outside the country, they go there and they have gluten and they do fine. So it's really about like all, all like the pesticides and chemicals and the things that they put in the gluten that it just really affects patients a lot more. Wow. I mean, it's so wild. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are a patient who's going to eat gluten anyway, at least try to get some digestive enzymes in or something to help okay. you break it down. <laughs> Take a little digestive enzyme before you eat it to, yeah. to try and help. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about that GI detox? That's a good one too. So that's for a that? binder. Okay. That's yeah. a binder. So that has like charcoal in it and it's really good to bind up like infections. Um, I, I love that one. I use it oftentimes with patients who have like mycotoxin issues, so mold, um, uh, parasites is a good one for that one. Mm. Uh, candida yeast fungus. You want to make sure your bowels are moving. That one can kind of stop you up a little bit. Mm. So you want to make sure you have good movement of your bowels. Cause then we're just like, let's say you're taking something to kill off infections and now we're binding it up, but we're not pooping it out. That can be an issue too. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, maybe let's talk a little bit about some of those things you're trying to detox, like heavy metals. Yeah. Do you find a lot of people are high in their heavy metals? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe it's like, there was a lot of seafood here in Florida, but even my patients that don't, that aren't from around here. Yes. Lots and lots of heavy metals are out there. I have, I, 
I wasn't going to tell a lot of stories, but I have to tell this. Tell one. a story. <laughs> I like a story. Yeah. I have this lovely patient um, and she went to New Orleans for the weekend and mm-hmm. then she had her blood draw on Monday and she had, what is it that they have? The crawfish? Crawfish? Oh yeah. Crawfish and oysters and all the things. Yeah. So yeah. two nights in a row, you know, she went all out and she ate all that. And Monday I was actually visiting my family and the girls from the office call me and they're like, Dr. Gandhi, so-and-so's arsenic is like, 80 something. And I think like, I mean, it should be like under one. I'd like my patients to be under one, but you know, even if it's under 10 and 80. I'm, yeah. And I'm like, Oh, and you know, and I'm like, <laughs> is she going to burn on fire? I, like, I'm like, yeah. I like call her up. I'm like, are you okay? What happened? Like, are you, are you feeling these things? You need to go to the hospital. She's like, no, Dr. Gotti, I feel okay. I'm like, well, what'd you do? Where have you been? And she's like, Oh, you know, I just went and visited family and I, you know, was in your own. I was like, what'd you eat there? And she like, just one weekend of wow. her eating that it shot up through the roof. And I mean, I just, okay, we got to recheck you. We got to make sure it's trending down. I'm like, stay away from shellfish, you know, it, I mean, it comes in apples, arsenic, it, it, rice, it wow. can be found in, um, you know, mercury is another big one. So your amalgam fillings is, uh, can carry a lot of mercury. And then if you're not eating the right type of fish that can have a lot of mercury in it too. Um, so avoid, would you suggest getting the fillings taken out? Yeah. For people that have them. I will send my patients to a biological dentist and Mm. have those fillings taken out. Again, it depends on the patient, their symptoms, how high their levels are. Um, I, you know, I think because there's so much that we can conquer in each patient just for like longevity and sustainability, it really comes down to like the patient, what they're feeling, what their symptoms are and like how aggressive I'm going to get with certain things, Mm, you know? mm -hmm. And if somebody's like really having a lot of numbness and tingling and autoimmune and yeah, I'm going to go hard on those patients. We're going to be pulling everything out of you, you know, but those patients are like, Oh, I feel great. And I'm just here for a little, like, you know, anti-aging and look at their labs and they're doing pretty good and they look great and they're working out. Then, you know, it might not be as aggressive. We'll talk about lifestyle changes and then we'll continue to monitor their labs and make sure that the levels are coming down. Uh, I have a lot of patients that I do chelation on them. Mm -hmm. They're coming in and actively getting the heavy metals pulled out. And sometimes you see the levels get worse before they get better because these metals latch on to your organs, your vessels, your tissues. They really dive deep into there. Um, what is chelation? What is chelation? Is it, it's part? Of, it's an IV, okay, and it has EDTA in it, which helps pull out heavy metals. Okay, and then you basically pee it out. Okay. Yeah. And then you take like the binder to, to kind of. That would be like your binder. Oh, okay. That would gotcha. be like as good as a binder. You have to take lots of minerals um, because it can pull out those healthy minerals too. So mm-hmm. we load up our patients on those minerals as well. Um, I do like binders. It doesn't mean if you do chelation, you can't have a binder. Um, it might be a bit much for the body. So I usually pick like one or the other, but definitely minerals across the board. Yeah. Keep those minerals. That's just good in general, right? Like to keep your minerals high, especially with the water. Like maybe we can talk a little bit about water and what, what do you suggest yeah. for water? Cause that's uh If you can, I love everybody to get a reverse osmosis system. That okay. would be the best thing. And then you do have to replace your minerals with that. Um, I love alkaline water. I love, you know, those carbon filters. If you're a renter, get a Berkey countertop filter. That's like another great option. Uh, you know, back to the minerals comment that you made, I want to point out, cause I know a lot of my patients, again, like struggle with those basic five or somebody who's even not my patient is trying to just get like a jump start and like trying to get on those basic five. The reasoning being not only are people just low across the board, but, um, you know, if you've ever traveled outside the country, you might notice that the fruits and vegetables literally in any other country taste so much better. Mm. It's just the soil and the nutrition in the food is higher. That's where that multivitamin comes in, Mm. you know, and a lot of multivitamins do have some minerals in it. So um, that, you know, even if you're eating so healthy and so clean, you still can be deficient. So I just wanted to point that yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's smart. You got to stay up on those vitamins. Is magnesium one that's, uh, another one that we should look. Yes. I love magnesium at. that does have so many functions in the body. It's so helpful. I don't necessarily add it into as like one of my main basic mm-hmm. fives. It is in your multivitamin. Mm-hmm. You do get some magnesium in there for those patients who have like blood pressure issues, severe headaches, 
um, you know, anxiety, depression, sleep issues. I love magnesium for mm. those patients or like a lot of muscle tightness. Magnesium's great because it's mm. a relaxer, but interesting. It can yeah. relax your colon too. Oh. So, <laughs> so you just have to be mindful about that. It, you know, if you're somebody more on the constipated side, love magnesium. Now, mm. if you're somebody who's like running to the bathroom a little bit more often and having loose stools, you might want to be a little bit mindful with the magnesium that you're taking, how much you're taking. Do you recommend like those powders? or how do you recommend taking magnesium? Mm, uh, all different ways. I okay. mean, there, I, I love the pill form. It, it, it comes down to the patient. If you're like, I can't swallow another pill, then we do the powders. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get it in the IVs too. Um, but if you're somebody who likes the pills, I, I you know, orthomolecular has a great uh, magnesium supplement that I prescribed to a lot of my patients. Okay. Um, I was going to ask about mold. Ah. Mold. <laughs> okay. Mold is something that I think a lot of people don't really think about. So how do you, like you're saying, you ask and, and sometimes you will find out if someone has had a leak or what, what if it's, what if it's something that you are, can't recall a leak or an intrusion of mold? Um, how, how much mold are we talking? Are we talking major, major mold? Or is this like a little mold in the shower type thing? Like, I can we, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's like dive into the mold thing. <laughs> yeah. So everybody's a little bit different on this one too. Okay. So you might feel terrible because you have some mold in your bathroom and your husband's going to look at you like, oh, what are you talking mm. about? Like, I feel fine, you know? Mm -hmm. So everybody's genetics are a little bit different in the way that they react to mold. And I see this so often, like half the family is like really, really sick from the mold. And the other half is like, we're fine. I don't know mm. what you're talking about. We all live in the same house. So I do think that, um, you know, mold, there's so many sources. One of the most common I would say is water damage buildings. Okay. And then, you know, those patients who are not cleaning out their vents often enough, you see a lot of mold issues in those patients as well. Um, and then you're going to start looking at your food, right? Yeah. So like dried fruit, gosh, oh. do we love it? But it is so moldy or peanuts are really moldy. Yes. A lot of grains are really moldy. How about like, I don't know about you. I've definitely done this before, especially in residency where like the tea bag and you leave it out for like 24 hours and the next day, ugh, oh, so gross. gross. So gross. <laughs> I was working so a lot then. Gross. I've gotten better <laughs> since then, but like so gross. You know, so it, it's a lot of great things around us that we don't even think about, but it's definitely there. I always have my patients, um, you know, call a mold inspector in if there's even a suspicion of mold in the house, because mm. I can detox the patient all I want for mold toxicity. But if they're living in it, it's again, going back to that bucket in the pouring rain, you know, yeah. which is going to keep filling right back up. What, what are some of the symptoms of mold toxicity? It's so broad. So I've had patients lose their hair. I've had mm. patients with like really severe, um, like eczema or psoriasis, autoimmune. I still to this day have not come across a patient with Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune thyroid, um, issue without mold toxicity. Really? They go hand in hand. There's so many articles online that you can read about that show that Hashimoto's mold hand in hand, um, and uh, you you can have weight gain or weight loss Interesting. with mold issues. A lot of like itchy eyes, dizziness, changes in the way you taste food can oh. be a mold thing. Um, cancer patients, again, another one I can't recall a patient that has cancer that um, didn't have mold toxicity or mold issues. Wow. Um, it, it's so inflammatory. It's so 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 inflammatory. So stay up on the mold. Yes. People. So you recommend a, like an air filter yeah. in your home? Yeah. Can yeah. you tell, like, tell us a good one? Yeah. I, like? I personally have the air doctor. Okay. That's, I'm a renter. So yeah. <laughs> if you're renting, air doctor is a great one. If you own your house in the actual um, air, air, your air conditioning, you can get like UV lights put in, which is really good too. Yes. But I still recommend in like the major bedrooms of your house to get an air filter. Actually, a friend of mine started that company, Fresh Air UV, oh, was nice. UV lights in the AC. Shout out to- uh, They're around here? <laughs> the and number. Nat family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they were amazing. So we have that in our, in our uh, air conditioner. Um, and yeah, like I, I, I had tested for mold as well. And it was something that I was like, I don't recall being exposed to any mold, but you know, I love dried mango and I love there peanut you butter. There you go. <laughs> and I've since kind of, I've, I've evolved those habits. Like I used to 
eat dried mango like crazy. But if, if you look at it, I mean, not to dog on dried mango, but when you take it out of the bag, sometimes it does seem like it's a little moist. You're like, oh, yeah, that I'm doesn't like, look that's right. like a little questionable. But it <laughs> tastes good. <laughs> it tastes really good. But And you know, yeah. that's the other thing is you could have been exposed when you were a child, mm. you know, and your body just never got rid of it. I have a lot of college students living in the dorms, exposed to oh. mold. I've had a couple of cops actually, and it was in their car. Oh yeah. Yeah. What do we do in the car? Like, oh. that's a really good point. That's a hard thing to kind of tackle. Cause what, how do you I've had few patients get new cars? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Cause like if there's a little leak in there when you sit in your car and it just smells a little funky and it's not right, it, there is a chance that there's probably in there. And you know, if, if you're somebody who's just not really driving a lot, it might be okay, you know, just to get it really like deep clean, cleaned out, you know, maybe even get like a little uh, ozone machine put in there and, you know, get it ozonated or something oh, like that. Oh, that's a good idea. But if you're somebody who's constantly in your car driving, I'd probably, you know, again, depending on how sick and how terrible you feel, I might suggest a new car, which wow. sounds ridiculous. Like I know, like not everybody can just go out and get a new car. I understand that, but yeah. it really comes down to your health and like where you are in that. If again, if you're really sick, that might be a conversation we would have. Yeah. Oh, breast gosh. implants, breast implants. That's oh. another big one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. The elephant in the room. Cause that that's probably something that a lot of people, they don't want to hear. No, it, it's always a conversation. I'm like, you know, we'll get your labs and we'll see where your numbers are at and we'll see how you're feeling. And if you don't feel well, then we'll re like, we'll revisit this conversation kind of thing. Cause I get it. Like what, we're going to send you to surgery, like every patient yeah. would, no, you know that, but some, I've had patients who've had those things in for 20 years now. Yeah. So, you know, the, the rule is every 10 years you should have them redone. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you're somebody who's just like chronically sick, chronically ill, and even with all the detox and eating well and the supplements and IVs and everything, and we're just not getting you to a good place, that'll be a conversation I'll have with my patients. How do those symptoms, because uh, I have heard, you know, breast implant illness, right? How do those symptoms kind of present? I mean, it is just this form of chronic inflammation. So mm -hmm. similar to mold, lots of rashes, hair issues, weight fluctuation, um, it, it, autoimmune, huge one with wow. breast implant illness, really big one. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's segue into autoimmune because- that's, that obviously like hits close to home for me. Yeah. Um, and tell us like, how do you like, how do you know that you might, or how do you know that you maybe should be tested for an autoimmune disease? I don't think that, I don't know. I, I don't expect patients to just be like, oh, I should be tested. I okay. just test yeah. all my patients. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> but I, I would say if you are somebody and you don't have access to a functional doctor and you're just going, you know, to your general practitioner and you want to bring up the conversation, um, chronic fatigue, joint pain, inflammation, um, you know, even like light sensitivity is a big one. Mm. Um, rashes is a big one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're overall like trying to live a pretty healthy lifestyle and you're just not feeling right and your general blood work looks pretty good, I think it's a conversation that you should discuss with your primary care physician. I don't think that people know how relevant and, and it, I mean, it's out there. I think there were, I think the last thing I read is that there's 80 to hundred million people with autoimmune dis disease. Wow. And that is more than like heart disease, diabetes, cancer combined. Wow. And if you look at every single specialty out there, endocrinology has autoimmune, neurology has autoimmune, um, gastroenterology has autoimmune, dermatology has, I mean, every single specialty out there has a form of autoimmune. And as an endocrinologist, you you know, your bubble is this, and this is what you're looking at. And it doesn't feel that big. And the neurologist and the endocrinologist, everybody has their little bubble of, of autoimmune. And you don't realize that it's huge. Like wow. if we all just start talking about it, it's like, oh no, 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 no. Half my patient population has autoimmune. Like yeah. let's get it out there. Probably more than half, honestly. And it, it's so relevant. I do think I'm hoping that one day, just even in like your annual physical that you have with your primary care, that maybe I, I hope that that's something that can just be tested. Like part wow. of your, you know, you get your cholesterol, you get your autoimmune panel. Like I, I hope it becomes just a norm. Is it, would you say it's more female 
more females have autoimmune than males? Okay. Why do do you think that is? It's just the genetics. It's just how Mm. it works. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky for us. I know. Right? We (laughs) get it all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's so much more prevalent in females and, um, but I think, I think I, I, I see it in men and they should also be tested as well. Yeah. So how do you, so with autoimmune, is it, is there always like an emotional trauma component to it? Or is that something that's hard to define? I would say it's hard to define, but I'm also going to say like, do I know anybody who's never had any emotional, like anything? Like, I feel like we all had like something, you know, we all had a little something, whether we have like acknowledged it or not. I I think that everybody's had a little something happen in their life. Right. I I honestly, I can't say that it, it correlates or not. Yeah. You know, it'd be really hard for me to say, but I definitely think that, you know, emotional trauma or somebody who suffers from anxiety, depression or probably more likely to get autoimmune just okay. because your your immune system's like out of whack and you know basically I don't I'm sure you know and maybe a lot of people know but what is autoimmune right it mm-hmm. is your immune system overreacting and attacking healthy cells and the this immune system should be fighting off viruses mold candida yeast But now it's attacking your thyroid and Mm -hmm. we call it Hashimoto's or it's attacking your skin and we call it psoriasis or your gut. And, you know, they all have names, but it's Mm. all under the same umbrella and it's just attacking a different organ in your body and causing different symptoms. But it all is kind of coming from the same place. Mm. And so, you know, traditional medicine or your conventional medicine what do they do? They suppress your immune system. Your immune system's overactive. So let's suppress it. And mm-hmm. sure, you're going to feel better. And there's a lot of benefits to some of those medicines. So I don't want to sit there and knock them all or anything. Yeah. But instead of saying, okay, you know, so-and-so has arthritis, let's put them on a biologic or something to suppress their immune system. Let's say, why do you have arthritis? Let's talk about that. Mm. And let's deal with the underlying cause and let's modulate, let's redirect your immune system. Instead of attacking your joints, let's attack this virus that's in your body or let's get rid of the mold or the candida and yeast. Mm -hmm. And across the board, um, those patients, their numbers get better. They feel better. Yes. My numbers are better and I feel better. (laughs) (laughs) But it it is, it's, I I think an important thing to talk about is that this journey, seeing a functional medicine practitioner, um, addressing all of these lifestyle things, it's not easy. No. Like I think people just think like, I I want to say (laughs) it's a part-time job. I want to say also, you're probably not going to feel great first, you're going to feel worse first and then better, right? Like you're tackling, you're killing out things. You're, <laughs> you know, you're addressing these issues. So don't get discouraged. I, Cause I do think it's overwhelming. I, yeah. I, I do think it's overwhelming. And so like, don't get discouraged, keep going with it, realize that you could feel worse and then, and then get to feeling really good. But the, the other side of it is so beautiful and amazing, yes, right? Yes. Like <laughs> baby steps one, one week at a time time and and any bit of better you can do for yourself is better in the long run. And you've seen so many success stories, I'm sure. So many. I I so many. Gosh, I I just I remember primary care and just one day like I don't feel proud of my work. Mm. And like now I feel like I can go home every day feeling like I I think I helped somebody today. Like I think somebody got better or somebody got like saw the light and wants to, you know, improve their life and work on longevity. And it's such a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And they really impacting. (laughs) Yeah. They feel so much good. And it's just, you see it in their face and they become friends and family at the end of the day. So then like the care is so much like more because you spend so much time with them. Yes. I felt that like I have felt that care and just a genuine concern for me and my yeah. life, my family. Yeah. And so I'm so appreciative of that. Good. Thank um, you. I do want to talk about, I want to like talk a little bit about how, how you eat in a day. Maybe you can give us some tips on food, yeah. different snacks. Like, yes. is there a smoothie that you like? Like, I know I would love for you to mention your soup, your bone broth soup, because <laughs> that, soup. that was really a, a turning point for me to have that available in my home. Um, everyone loves it. So anyway, so tell me more about the food stuff. Yeah. So typically when I wake up in the morning, I do have a tall glass of warm water and sometimes I'll squeeze some lemon in there um, just to kind 
kind of get something warm and good for my gut going. Um, and whatever supplements I need to take on an empty stomach. That's really like, I take mm-hmm. that, it's on my nightstand. I take it first thing in the morning. Um, one of my first meals of the day is typically a protein shake. Mm-hmm. I know a lot mm-hmm. of people struggle with what to have for breakfast. Um, I'm across the board protein shake. I really like the company OptiCleanse GHI. Sorry, the company is Zymogen. It's called OptiCleanse GHI. Okay. There's so much stuff. And if, if you look at the label, I mean, it's really long. And even if like that's all you do for the day, you know, you got some basic good nutrition in. Yeah. Um, and so that protein shake in the morning, I'm usually doing like a scoop of almond butter in there. I'm throwing some collagen powder in there. I make my own almond milk. So I usually use that in there. I might put like one fruit in there. Um, I put a lot of L-glutamine in there for my gut. Mm. I do my greens powder. It tastes so good. I use the kid's greens powder. And tastes really which, which one? Can you tell that us? That one's by Designs for Health. Okay. And it's just the chocolate greens powder for kids. Okay. <laughs> so okay. yummy. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I put so much stuff in my protein shake in the morning. So I know like I'm kind of set. I've set myself up for like a good day. Yeah. And um, probably between my first and lunch patient, I probably have another protein shake. Oh, to a double shake. Yeah, okay. I like so it. I like you it. should be eating your desired weight in grams of protein for like muscle maintenance. Okay. And so, you know, whatever your weight is, you're trying to hit that and it gets tough. It's not easy. Yeah. So, it's not easy to do so that much protein. By yeah. the time lunch comes around, I've probably <clears throat> hit 40 to 50 grams of protein. Um, lunch, Across the board, it's usually bone broth soup. Um, I love buying organic bone broth. You know, a lot of my patients make their own. Good for you. Oh, <laughs> so that's proud aggressive. Of you. Yeah, that's aggressive. I, <laughs> I just buy organic bone broth and I usually put a bunch of veggies in there and I make a big pot usually on Sunday and have that for like maybe like three, four days. You have to be careful. Not everybody can have leftovers. If you're a high histamine patient, sometimes mm. leftovers are not for you. So you'd be a patient that would freeze it okay. and then just heat it up every day after that. Oh, good point. Um, okay. But lots of veggies go in there. Um, if you're struggling with anemia, I usually throw like lentils and greens in there too. I throw some shredded chicken in there, or if you like turkey, you can throw that in there. Um, so that lunch can be another 50, 60 grams of protein. Mm-hmm. By the end of lunch, I've usually hit my protein goals, but I like to eat. So then dinner ends up being, um, some kind of protein, lean meat, lots of veggies, rice, it, it, you know, my ve- vegan vegetarians are eating a lot more beans throughout the day. Okay. My snacks, I love lupini beans. I sell them at Whole Foods. I buy a little packet and usually eat that throughout the day. I usually do about two servings of fruit or less a day. I don't try to go over that. Um, I do like to munch on olives. I I started that actually. Yeah. You got me started on the olives as a snack and yes. they make these little snack packs um, yeah. that I've traveled with them and it's like a great salty It's so thing. good. Yeah. It's so good. It's like good fat, kind of like yeah. maybe you don't crave as much sugar, right? If you're yeah. like yeah. having those good fats. <laughs> Lots of almonds I'll eat. Not a lot, but I'll have like a handful of almonds throughout the day. Um yeah, I'm trying to like go through my fridge right now, like what is setting in there. But those are probably like a lot of the main things that I'm eating throughout yeah. the day. Um, and you know, if it, I try to get my patients to understand like food is fuel mm-hmm. and you eat to like, like help your body drive. I know a lot of patients struggle with like their, you know, different um, cravings that they have. And so I tease them at home. It's like getting excited to put gasoline in your car because yeah. that's basically what food is for your body. But for those patients that really need that like sweet thing, um, lots of healthy, sweet options out there too. You know, you don't have to like completely cut everything out. I mean, they have so many chocolates now that are like vegan or that are made with monk fruit. So I yeah. usually suggest something like that for patients who are trying to transition to a healthier lifestyle. Always find you an alternative that's yes as good and can get you there. <laughs> that's what I need. You know that. <laughs> I needed the hand holding with the sugar thing, which, you know, I do try to do a little dark chocolate. Sometimes a little turns into a lot, but hey, you know, we, we try and do our best. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Yeah. Gandhi, thank you so much. I'm so excited. We're actually doing a part two where we're going to dive more fully into autoimmune and parasites and all kinds of like, you know, things. So uh, tune in for that as well. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. If you guys liked this episode, please like it, review it, share it with somebody you love. There's so much good information in here and we'll see you next time on The Cinnamon Effect. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) 